nine and a half minutes. I timed myself, so um, I think we're good to start broadcasting. We're live streaming. <laughs> it's very exciting. Um, I wish I had a podium, but there wasn't any room for a podium. So we're doing it this way. Um, so I'm sorry if I sort of flub this um, with the foggy glasses and you know the masks. Um, but thank you everybody for coming tonight um, to this to this event. Um, my panelists and moderators. Um, for those of you who may not know me, I'm Julie Dickover, and I'm the director of the Chris Butler Art Museum here at Flyblower. Um, I'm going to try to make these brief. My remarks brief, but first and foremost, I'd like to thank the Flyblower College's Black Student Association for co-hosting this event with me, um, or with the Chris. Um, our moderator, Shawana Brooks, and Rory Thompson, um, and to all artists, Chris Clark, and could you just raise your hand, everybody raise your hand as I am saying, Chris Clark, Aaron Hendrick, Dustin Harewood, Princess Simpson Rashid, and Roosevelt Watson III. Um, thank you all for allowing us to include your work in our current exhibition, The Nameless Now, um, and for agreeing to be a part of tonight's event. So before I introduce everyone, I wanted to just very quickly talk about the exhibition itself. Um, it's on view at the museum through October 24th, and it's open to all five of students, staff, and faculty. Um, and we're currently working on a virtual exhibition for those of you in the community who want to look and look at the show. Um, I began organizing this exhibition late last spring when it was really unclear whether or not you know Fiber would be open or the museum would be able to be open. Um, taking a deep breath here. <laughs> um, it started out as a faculty exhibition, but I decided it would be a great opportunity to sort of celebrate local artists, um, and so, you know, and to celebrate the great work that's being made in our area. So in addition to inviting some artists myself, I also asked um, some of the faculty members in the Department of Visual Arts to nominate a local artist whose work that they admire, that they have admired. Um, and the result of this is a huge group show with 35 artists and over 65 objects. Um, I thought a lot about the exhibition title, um, The Nameless Now, is what we, we ended up landing on, but I had hoped to come up with something that really sort of encapsulated a feeling that I've been having over the past several months um, that I think is shared by a lot of people. And that's just how difficult it is to articulate what's going on in the world. Um, so when my friend and another artist in the exhibition, Madeline Peck Wagner, and I were texting back and forth with some potential title possibilities, she sent me the phrase, the nameless now, and it felt right. Um, and that phrase comes from a poem called In Blackwater Woods by Mary Oliver, um, who's a wonderful poet. And you know the phrase of the poem itself really resonated with me, and I wish I had time to read it to you now, but try to rush because there's lots of interactions to me. Um, so I encourage you to look it up and read it, and hopefully it will resonate with you as well. Um, the exhibition is not necessarily thematic, but there's plenty that's been on my mind um, just through the past several months that helped to shape it, such as navigating a world pandemic. Um, and, and just the general, general tumultuous, tumultuous time, you know, that is our political, social, and cultural climate right now. Um, at the time, um, in late spring, I was reading a book uh, entitled Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown, who is an author, a doula, a women's right, rights activist, and black feminist based in Detroit. Um, very broadly, the book provides strategies that we might employ in building social justice movements in order to make this world a place that we want to actually live in. Um, the book stresses concepts of interconnectedness, cooperative work, adaptability, and collective leadership, and how small-scale solutions can be used to address larger-scale problems. Um, this book talk took on even more significance as the country erupted in protests as a response to the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, 
Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. Um, and, you know, I really believe that art in all of its sort of varieties um, plays such a crucial role in our community. And I, I believe it's a vehicle that can help propel us to a better place. And so I hope that some of the wonderful work that Joanna and Rory and all of our panelists tonight are doing will help it, of us to see what is really possible. So with that, I'd like to introduce everybody. And I'll try to make this quick so we can get right to the conversation. Shawana Brooks is a spoken word poet, a memoirist, author, and avid public speaker whose art revolves around all things literary. In the Jacksonville, Florida community, she is a community curator, art consultant, and the owner of a public arts agency who works to amplify Black artists through representation and visual communication. Former curator at the Main Library for the city of Jacksonville, Brooks has been recognized by her peers, rece receiving the Cultural Council of Greater Jacksonville's second prestigious award, the Robert R. Lee White Award for Artist Advocacy in 2018, and this year won the council's highest honor, the Helen Lane Founder Award. Brooks is the first Black person to win both awards. She is a recipient of the Community Foundation of Northeast Florida Art Adventures Individual Artist Grants. The Yellow House Gallery hosted her first art exhibit centered on her writing, Magic, Mirth, and Mortality, Musings on Black Motherhood. Her current projects include placemaking through her art consulting business, the Six Foot Away Gallery, and the public art project Color Jacks Blue, which we will hear about tonight. Um, in all of these roles, she is supported by her partner and husband, partner, painter Roosevelt Watson III. Rory Thompson is a student here at Flagler College. Rory is pursuing a Bachelor of Arts degree with a double major in digital media production and media studies with a minor in film studies. He was born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida, and is the president of Flagler College's Black Student Association. Growing up with a passion for stories and storytelling, he quickly fell in love with video storytelling via film and television. At the age of 10, he started making home movies and stop motion videos. At the age of 17, he made his first short film, Fourth of July. Since then, Rory has worked with various sports organizations, including the Jacksonville Sharks, the Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp, the Jacksonville Giants, the St. Augustine Glory, and Flagler College Athletics. Christopher Clark work, lives and works in Jacksonville, Florida. His work will be included in the upcoming Florida Biennial at the Arts and Culture Center in Hollywood, Florida, and in the clouds at Mize Gallery in St. Petersburg, Florida. Past exhibitions include Through, Through Our Eyes, Journey to South Africa at the Ritz Theater Museum in Jacksonville, but then traveled to the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan Art Museum in Port Elizabeth, South Africa, um, among many other exhibitions throughout the United States. He was awarded two upcoming artist residencies at the House of Zadulo in London, England, and the Chateau Orqueva, sorry, butchering that, in Champagne, Ardennes, France. Erin Pendrick is an international artist and arts educator from Jacksonville, Florida. She has exhibited her work in museums, galleries, and alternative spaces throughout the United States and abroad. After receiving a BFA from Florida State University in 1999 and an MFA in drawing and painting at Georgia State University in 2003, she worked for many years as a studio artist and arts educator in Atlanta, Georgia. She is currently the lead visual art instructor at Jacksonville Arts and Music School. Having taught at every level, including higher ed, she was named the Cultural Council of Greater Jacksonville's 2019 Art Educator of the Year. She has won several grants, including the Jackie Cornelius Art, art Residency Grant, the Lift Every Student Artist in Residence Grant, and the Community First Foundation Art Ventures Individual Artist Grant. Aaron maintains a studio at Cork Arts District in Jacksonville. Dustin Harewood was born and grew up in New York City in the late 1980s and became a junior member of the Brooklyn Museum at seven years old. His family later moved back to Barbados where he attended high school. He received his BA from North Carolina Central University and his MFA from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. His work has been exhibited widely, most recently last winter as a part of the three-person exhibition, The Black Beach, with Malcolm Jackson and Jordan Walter at Cathedral Arts Project and the solo exhibition Warm Rain and Electricity in 2019 at Star Tower, both in downtown Jacksonville. Forgetting everyone. 
got two more. <laughs> oh, I'm not done with Dustin. Dustin has twice read has been twice recognized with the Distinguished Faculty Award from Florida State College of Jacksonville, where he is a professor of art and has taught since 2004. In 2017, the Cultural Council of Greater Jacksonville awarded him the Prize of Arts Educated, Educator of the Year as well. Princess R Simpson Rashid was born in Atlanta, Georgia, in 1972. She studied printmaking and painting at Escuela de Arte Plástica in San Juan, Puerto Rico. She earned her BS in physics and a math minor from Georgia State University in Atlanta. Rashid recently served as a 2020 Peyton Endowed Guest Artist at the Bull School in Jacksonville, where she exhibited and taught high school students various methods of monotype printmaking. Later this fall, she will serve as the North, the Nathan Wilson, Nathan Wilson Center for the Arts, FSCJ Visiting Artists and Residents, also concentrating on in printmaking. Her work has been included in exhibitions such as the recent The Ballad and the Brush, celebrating women's suffrage through art at the Puget's Museum, and The Odyssey of Abstraction at the Vault at 1930 Gallery. Her work is included in the public collections of the Baptist MD Anderson Cancer Center and the Museum of Science and History, MOSH, in Jacksonville, where she also operates her studio practice within the Court Arts District. And last but not least, Roosevelt Watson III is trained as a painter but works across materials and substrates in a project-oriented mode that draws from surrealism, art povera, and assemblage. His primary focus is to make works that tell the stories of his home community with a focus on joy, faith, and symbolism. His most current projects, with help from his partner and wife, Shulman Brooks, are the Six Foot Away, Feet Away Gallery and Color Jack Blue, a public mural and voting project. Watson received his BFA from the Atlanta College of Art, now the Savannah College of Art Design. His work has been commissioned by the Ritz Theater and the Leah Museum in Jacksonville, Florida, the Emanuel Church in Tampa, Florida, the Boys and Girls Club of Hilton Head, South Carolina, and the Cummer Museum of Art and Gardens in Jacksonville. Um, just a couple of notes before we get going. So we're trying to figure out the best way for people who are in the audience to ask questions, and so, on our Instagram account, which if you don't follow it, please do, it's Chris Eller Art. I made a story that has a questions field, and if we come to the end of the, the question, the discussion period, if you have a question, please type that in, and I'll field it and ask the questions to the panelists. Um, and then finally, for any students who might be following along via the Zoom um, live stream, just don't forget to make sure that your name, it's your full name, um, is listed as that is my record that you have attended this co-curricular event. So without further ado, thanks to everybody for coming. Um, I hope you enjoy this and please join me in welcoming our panel. Sometimes know that or not. 
So we live um, in a neighborhood that still doesn't necessarily have a major um, identity. Uh, some people call it a stereotype community. A lot of times it has intersections around Durkinville and um, Newtown. So for you all who don't live in Jacksonville, I know all of those don't make major any sense. But these are areas that have been redlined and are predominantly Black communities. So in our own neighborhood, we saw the lack of public art, and we thought we could do something by just putting art in our own yard. So within that being a quarantine, we just thought, like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll try this. And what better to try it with um, <laughs> of my husband's art, since it was so available to me, and it was easy to export it right into our backyard. That grew um, with uh, some interesting national press which allowed us to have a fundraiser, um, which called Artists Are Essential. In that, we wanted to make the notion that artists were being um, not allowed to be able to kind of have the same privileges as a lot of other small businesses, especially not corporations, but they are small businesses, right? Um, they have resources, they have bills they need to pay, they also are doing this on a professional level. It's not always for a level of exposure. And especially you heard the resumes of these five individuals, we knew that if we're going to be working and with this kind of expertise of artists, we also need to pay them appropriately. So luckily we were able to raise um, quite a bit and that's how we gave uh, a stipend commission to all 20 of those artists to participate. Um, we were able to access a great building that kind of made this a little bit of a bigger project than what we intended. It allowed us to do um, several specific murals at one time we thought that these murals would also kind of work to the artist's own intention and how they work in their process. And um, through my creative direction, I helped to kind of guide them to specific uh, pieces and kind of, you know, I guess we'll see design elements around art that I thought would be most communicative to the community that we work in. And that's kind of how it was all born. And this is all things that happened as um, early as the end of April. And the Color Jacks Blue Project started at the beginning of July. We are still working in it uh, because it's, it's very hard to do a major public project in the summer and, and anywhere in Florida, and especially when the heat is excessive and the rain was so unpredictable. It literally rains like for a whole month straight, like almost every day, right? So that consistently challenges us. And as well as you, the artists were already working on work they already were doing and their own projects and a lot of times their own exhibitions that were coming up. So it was just kind of building all that collective energy and bringing that back into the community and prioritizing specific um, ways to talk back without having to worry about who's listening or who's engaging that work when it doesn't live to come to the institution. So that's the overall kind of spin of how that kind of started. And I think from there, I'll start with the first kind of question. And we wanted to make this very open very collective, just a conversation with you guys. Like, hello, friends. Um, you know, like, we don't have to feel like so conservative. You see a good portion of everybody right there, but that's not completely everyone. And so some of you all had did some large-scale, you know, public projects on your own, or were able to create and do things more in a public setting. So, you know, not to say that this was everybody's first opportunity to do something of this magnitude. I just wanted to see, like, how has it been like to collaborate on this kind of large scale public private project? Any of you um, who feel the opportunity so want to answer can just kind of remind the group of who you are. Hello, everyone. I am Erin Kendrick, and um, I am one of the now muralists. That's a new title for me as a part of this project. Um, I am one of three female artists, women artists, including Princess here, and also Tracy Mims, and we are working on the Moms of the Movement side of the project, of the mural. So on our wall, one, we are painting five active women, with an X, um, activists in Jacksonville. And this project has been interesting for all three of us. This is our first mural. So we are sort of learning and doing at the same time. It's been a long process. Of course, the weather has been a monster. 
and, and hoping that we can kind of get through the bulk of it in August because we all sort of go back to work, you know, school starts and all that. Um, but we've been just kind of, you know, getting through it. We are, I would say, Justin and I were talking very near, maybe about 75% done. We're working on our last activist right now on our wall. And, and, you know, we're sort of like seeing the end finally. And we're going to be able to get through this all in the next couple of weeks. Um, but it's been great. Like, it's been really great. And it's just been great. Like, for me personally, one of the best things about doing this mural at this time in this neighborhood has just been interacting with people in the neighborhood. Like I'm not from this specific neighborhood, but I'm not from far away from it either. And, and where I'm from is pretty similar. And a lot of times people write those neighborhoods off and write off the people in those neighborhoods, but they have shown us so much love um, just for being there and doing that and putting something that they see as beautiful in their neighborhood and investing in their neighborhood. And also I would say being kind of protective of their neighborhood because they'll come up and they're like, who is this? And what is this building for? And why are you painting this here? So to see them both, you know, extend their hand out to us, but also take take responsibility for their neighborhood, it's just been a really great experience for me personally. Hi, I would say as uh, for myself, um, being a part of this been several blessings already from working with two amazing artists like Aaron and Tracy. Um, has, has been amazing for me, um, getting to know them better. And our work relationship has uh, blossomed. Like, we work really well together, um, which is uh, which is a real blessing because, you know, ours so are, we have egos and, you know, <laughs> and stuff like that. But instead of uh, letting ego get in the way, we are focusing on what the purpose of our project is, and that is doing, doing right by these people and uh, doing right by the activists, doing right by the, the project initiative. And um, one of the other blessings is, I agree with Aaron, is uh, just listening to the people as they, they walk, while we're painting, whether it's in the daytime or at night, there's people walking up and down the street, people of that community who are just you know, living their lives. And they see this structure and they see what we're doing and uh, we're using quality paint. We're, 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 um, we have all these machines and we're just re and we're really just putting our time in um, all all throughout the week, and uh, they are talking to us and saying the most positive things and how much they appreciate us being there. That's the thing we keep hearing consistently. And for myself, the lesson I've I've, learned, I've always thought about public art as special and important, but for myself, I feel that I definitely want to continue in this vein because. Make, as an artist, I always wanted to make an impact with people. I want my work, even though I'm an abstract artist mostly, I want my work to speak to people and touch people's hearts and touch them emotionally. And I see with public art, mural work specifically, that is a way I can I can have a great impact with a large amount of people from one project. And that, that means a lot to me. Um, I just want to interject quickly, and we have also Chris, if you wouldn't mind answering this question, Aaron. Spoke to the fact that on her wall, she's working with um, three women, and that was very intentional for that particular context. And so, even on the Black Votes Matter mural side, which to me is one of the most important sides of all three sides of what this building is, right? It's the reason for the season. I really wanted Chris to work on that wall. He might want to tell the artist where to go. And I also thought it was very really clear that Tatiana Kitchens. Was working with you as well as Marsha Hatch, those are also two other women. We wanted to make sure to split the difference of representation. A lot of times, um, mural, when you think of that, when you see that, especially in the art city or different cities, kind of have a white male face to it. So I thought it was important to make sure to have five black women represented, five black men. But I love always the relationship that you and Tatiana have with working with one another and honestly have done. Most you know, uh, when I think of black mural art now, um, you're definitely you all are at the top. Uh, you've done that, you know, you've done that work on your own. Can you talk a little bit about that collaboration and working together as well as this? Yeah, so, um, my name is Chris Clark. Uh, I'm a, I wouldn't necessarily call myself a muralist, I don't think I have that meaning under my belt yet. But um, my friend Tatiana and I, we have the same birthday, so we play around and call each other um, twins. So we just we mesh real well together. And um, I think our very first mural, from the uh, well, the very first mural that I've had, um, Tatiana was the first person I called. Um, I've always admired her work, 
and her style, her style was managed well together. And so that was probably around 2018, we did one in a dance studio for, uh, yeah, we did so for um, Gerard's Brown, the Punch Factory, it's a, um, a predominantly, um, I wouldn't say predominantly black, they have other, other students, but um, it, it's in the black community and in certain uh, urban areas where kids don't have access to an uh, arts program and, or dance program. So that was our first mural we did. And then we worked so well together with that mural that we just continued. And um, so I wanted to talk more about the mural that we're doing right now. Um, which one says is one of the more important sides about uh, voting and about getting black people and yeah, black community um, educated on voting and um, really motivated to go out and vote. And so for me personally, I haven't always been like the type of person who thought that voting mattered or who really thought that my vote mattered or counted. And um, I feel like it's very important to, to put this message in a community where other people may feel that way. And especially for me to be a black artist, putting this message up, um, I feel like it, it's something that the community really um, resonates with and um, something that they can connect to, especially coming from someone who looks like them and, and who once upon a time maybe thought like them, thought that you know, they both didn't count. And uh, so for me, I feel like in this moment, especially with the uh, person we have in the uh, president's seat right now, I feel like it's important for everyone to uh, get out and vote, and especially us, for us to know that our vote does count and that it, it does matter, and um, it, it, it's important, and it will affect the, uh, the future and everything. So yeah, I'm very honored to, um, to be working on that side, and also with the artists I'm working with, with Tatiana, also with uh, artist Marsha Hatcher. Um, she's kind of like a local legend to me. Um, and so it, it, she, she's like a um, kind of like a master artist, like a master teacher. So um, it's, it's been a pleasure to work with her and work up under her and, and learn from her. Um, like Aaron said, we are, we've all, um, we're still working on the mural. Basically, Marsha Hatcher, she finished like in week one. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you for that, Roy. Um, so, I'm, like I said earlier, or like um, Julie said earlier, I'm from Jacksonville, so I have had the pleasure to see a lot of your hard work in person or on social media um, from various artistic friends. And I've kind of noticed there's been signs of kind of a black art renaissance emerging, especially in places like Jacksonville. Um, how does the prospect of such a like, phenomenon like excite you? Well, I, I would say that uh, I was always, um, when I first got activated to considering uh, the profession of art, I was uh, living in uh, Puerto Rico and uh, just reading, uh, just devouring art books and everything. And I, I grew up in New Jersey and, um, and I, I'm from Georgia land, but uh, I didn't have a lot of exposure to black artists, and um, and I knew a lot about I knew a lot about European artists, but I didn't know a lot about black artists. And in this library where I was spending a lot of my time, uh, there was this book about the Harlem Renaissance, and I never had heard of it before. It was disgusting. I mean, I, was, I had already had a bachelor's degree, and I was a woman, I was grown up, and everything I had never heard of Harlem Renaissance was just. You know, after I'm learning about it, then I'm learning about after cold brown, I'm learning about all these movements and uh, people felt a little like me. And um, I was like, I was disgusted with myself being so ignorant, but also now I'm happy that I'm learning about all this stuff, that, all this wealth of information. So I was very enamored with the idea of Black Renaissance and the history of it. And, and as I went more into uh, devoting my life to becoming an artist, I, I wanted to be part of something like that again in my time. And I, I think what we're all realizing, or I hope we're all realizing that this is our moment, like all of us, this is our moment. You know, when we read about the Holocaust and all that kind of stuff and what people went through with the Cultural Revolution and all that kind of stuff, that was what they did and that was history, but we are in history now, we're making it now, all of us. So what we do, we'll make it. So. 
I think we're all, we, I do agree we're in a, a new renaissance and I'm glad to be part of it. Well, I think I would piggyback off of um, what Francis said about not knowing anything really about black artists. Um, I'm, I'm probably the youngest person up here, I think. Um, and so I, I, my age group, we've had more access, you know, because of the internet and everything. But it wasn't until I was probably in my late 20s, I'm 32 now, but my late 20s, that's when I first uh, found out about artists like Augusta Savage, um, Jacob Lawrence, Romare Beard, and the first artist I had ever heard of, black artist, was Basquiat. And that's because Jay-Z, I know you guys know who uh, Jay-Z is, Jay-Z and Beyonce, but uh, Jay-Z had partnered with uh, the Reebok, Reebok brand, and he was putting Basquiat's work on clothing and on shoes. And um, I didn't even know that he had passed away at the time. I'm like, who's this artist? Like, my dog can, can draw that stuff. <laughs> but, um, like, once I started to, like, delve deeper into it and, and do my research, I found that there were, like, so many black artists out there from the past and current. Um, people like Kahindi Wiley, um, Amy Sherrill, Kerry James Marshall, one of my favorite artists. And so just seeing those artists inspired me to take my art more seriously. And um, like just seeing that reflection of myself, let me know that like, I can do this too. Like if, if Carrie James can do it, or um, if Derek Adams can do it, then you know I can make a career out of this also. And I always wonder like where I would be today had I seen that, had I seen those images a lot sooner. And so I think it's very important, um, this movement that we're in right now, um, just for art in general, um, I feel like art history is missing a big chunk that uh, should have been in those history books and that should have been in those lessons and we're just getting it all like it's all coming in fast right now and um, I think that's a great thing and like Princess said I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it and I want to be that, that artist for the next generation that, um, that I didn't see growing up. Yeah I think you know it's so funny we're, we're in this time and sometimes when you're in the time, you, you, you kind of can't step back to see where you're going. And this is why it's so important, um, you know, when you're getting education or you're looking for certain viewpoints to extend that, because you'll see those connections, right? Like, how you see, how you see things that feel so concurrent right now, but those are also things that were coming up in the 60s. And speaking about like, all these different artists um, in that kind of chasm, but also who get connected into that chasm can also be a bit uh, narrated within some supremacy terms because of who they talk about or who learn about or who you get educated about or who sits at the, the top of Black excellence in art isn't always still represented by Black people or Black artists themselves don't always get to control that. So I think within thinking a little bit within that space, I'll go to uh, our next question, which really excites me and I hope it loves us and that you really all have fun. The conversation for this, like you all have experiences working within the institutional system, right? Working now either displaying in libraries or museums, and also in the <laughs> the, the low gallery system, I'll say of Jacksonville, but also in just the, the high gallery system that exists in our nation. And so, when you think about your experiences and making work in the public and community, like as you have to us, and like. When you traveled to Japan and then when you went to like back to like you know home and do things specifically within those public projects, right? That at the top of the floor is very exhausting, but this is the time, you know, like the summer at that time that you normally you don't take off, you run to go to these public projects, but you also have really started to look back at Jacksonville as a place to want to exhibit and to do that work too. So when you're kind of doing first in the public and you're thinking about the institutional realm, you know, and think about the access of who has, who can come to that art, right? And the community building. Like, you know, what what, what are those differences for you? Like, how do you see those value systems and what things would need to change? That's a, there's a lot in that question. That's why I'm here to you, Professor. That's not fair. Okay. <laughs> um, I think we're talking about the idea of public art versus kind of more of the gallery system. Those two, um, Hmm. I think it was probably about 10 years ago or so when I did the 
my first mural. And that was in a small village in Barbados. And I think um, I'd actually had work in a gallery in Barbados, but my whole thing was, will I be satisfied if I have this piece in this gallery and it's shown there, and then that's all that happens during the few months that I would be there. And it didn't feel like it would be satisfying. So I decided that I was gonna work in public for the first time. And I met a lot of people on the street who were very, very confused about what I was doing because murals are not, were not a regular thing in that space. And I think I got way more satisfaction with my interaction with people in that, in that community than having the work on display in the gallery. I almost forget about the work in the gallery, but I'll always remember the conversations and interactions that I had over like the 10 day span that I worked on the larger piece. Yeah, so that kind of that's gonna make good. Yeah. So like now I'm thinking about you just talked a little bit about the access, right? Like mm -hmm. being out in the community, knowing that that community wasn't necessarily going to come to the museum to work on, right? Um, <laughs> and you had your work um, in the current museum of Martin Garden. Um, so and even thinking of that kind of institutional space and the access that you have done with work either in Jacksonville or again coming outside of see it. How do you see? How do we need to break down more access, or do we need to do that? Well, this is fascinating, guys, because here's the question. I mean, traditionally, is visual was visual art for everyone, or was it for a specific class of people? If we're talking about that Western timeline that we are supposed to that we study in school, who was it for? Was it for kings and queens and rich folks, right? Was it for the elite? Was it always for the one percent? When we look back now at the work that if people were traveling to Louvre to see all of this work, I mean, who is the work for? But then that's that specific context that we study, yes? So, but then we have other civilizations where it's all weaved into all sorts of um, customs, yes? And it's part of religion and it's part of just kind of a daily life thing, yes? But then here's the other thing, so we got Fine art. So when we separate fine art from craft, is craft the thing that we live with and experience all the time? Is fine art supposed to be this thing that mostly the one percent enjoy, separate from the broader community? These are some very interesting questions that I feel like we can all bounce around and discuss amongst ourselves. I mean, is all of this art for everyone, or is there work that's supposed to be made that's only supposed to be made for a specific group of thinkers? So that's the one small answer question. <laughs> you know, with that thing that feel like a, a good thought process, right? We talk about art for everyone and now what's kind of changed or how people want more art in these spaces. And so I guess Aaron and talking about what Dustin was saying, right about that one percent that this is one percent who the art is made for. We we know that less than one percent of art is collected in you know by museums for artists of color, and specifically when it comes to black women. It's, it's so low, it's not even a percentage, right? You're making this work, you're also an art educator, you know, you went to school, you know this difference of wanting that this institutional support with these major museums that wanted to be collected, right? But they're still showing us that they're not, they're showing that work, but they're not collecting that work. Hold on one second, Aaron, and when you go ahead and answer that question, I always wondered when it comes to black culture, why is it that music has always been so accessible to everyone? And it's for some reason, Princess mentioned earlier, this idea of visual art has always been this very specific thing that's been hard to find. I don't think we have any problem with black culture and music. I think historically it's been a thing about visual arts and black culture and how that factors in. Sorry. Um, for me, I have a, like an interesting perspective here, both as an artist, as sort of like a budget collector and as an educator. Um, I think one thing does in, as far as the music goes, is um, music for a time lacked the visual. And then as the visual sort of was brought into music, it was very specific. It was very, 
Um, we didn't really, I think at the time, have a lot of agency in that. Like, you know, in terms of like what videos were made and things like that. It was all very stereotypical just as imagery started to kind of work its way into that. So when you talk about like visual art and museums and stuff, you're essentially um, welcoming in sort of like the black body, you know. Um, in, in a place where things are sometimes considered beautiful, and now you have this sort of this challenge of this black body that you've been taught is not so beautiful, and sort of reconciling that in those spaces. And I, I would probably say for many of us, especially for me, you know, I grew up in Jacksonville, there weren't a lot of times where I went into a museum on my school field trip or something like that. Like all I remember from museums as a child are white men on horses. That's all I remember. That's it. You know, and I've always been a creative kid. All I remember are like white men on horses. So, like that means, you know, that means something. Like Chris, um, it wasn't until college, really, that I was introduced to like black artists who actually do this thing as a living, you know, but it's not just about can you go to school and learn to draw a paint. Like, there are people out there sort of like doing this thing in these spaces for real. So, as an educator, it's important for me to not just teach, and I teach just about every age. Like at this, at this moment right now, I teach um, at, from first grade to 11th grade in, a, in an after school program. I've taught at the higher ed level, I've taught you know, high school, middle school, but I do my best to not just teach them like how to paint and draw, but like everything else around them. And, and we talk about, you know, if, you talk, if I tell somebody I'm an artist, and the first thing they say is, you know, if I'm not an artist, you know, I can't draw at all. So the first thing we have to unpack in the classroom is that all art is not about drawing, and all art is not about drawing realistically. So let's, let's talk through and unpack some of those things and see if there is a place for you in this thing that we call art. So the first thing for me in the classroom is to sort of really expand the notion of what art is, and then we get to like where art belongs and where art can exist. And we have a conversation about institutions and access and things like that. And you know, I've had students come to an event, you know, which essentially would be like a black event. Like the opening of the Augusta Savage show at the Cumberland Museum, one of my at the time college students, and she actually never been in my college classroom, but she's kind of my college student, was at the show and she was asked by like an older white person, like, what are you doing here? You know. And I mean, like, just little small things like that, these kind of like, you know, little microaggressions that happen. And it makes us even to this day, like, challenge each other, you know, what are we doing here? So in my teaching, it's about exposing those types of things. In my advocacy, it's about raising the alarm on those things. So I did let that museum director know that that happened. I did make a specific request about how I expected as a museum patron, what I expected from the museum going forward, and you know, hopefully kind of help make some changes, but it's about agency for me. So in my classroom, I'm teaching kids how to make art, but I'm also teaching them how to like take agency and how to demand certain things from spaces. And when those spaces um, and institutions don't create a space for you, you know, we have somebody like Shawana, who is a, who's, is a living example of how to do this stuff yourself. So you don't always have to go knock on somebody else's door. Like you can build your own door, you can build your own building, build your own table. So when it comes to all these like institutions and spaces, you know, yeah, it's cool. Um, it's cool to you know get them in some major museum or something like that. But if I don't, you know, that's okay. If I don't, and instead I go and help somebody else build something or build something myself, that's just as valuable. I think also that the, with the, the times is changing, like this, this situation is uh, COVID and all that is exasperating and everything, but um, for a while, for at least a decade or so, museums have been suffering and they have been suffering from a paradigm problem, in my opinion, is uh, there are people who don't feel comfortable coming to galleries and museums. I mean, there's people, I know people in the African American community, um, and, uh, and other minority communities who are so uh, high educated, um, have money or whatever, it, it doesn't matter whether they're, from, they're poor or they are middle class or whatever, 
they don't feel welcome in these spaces for whatever reason, microaggression, and they don't see themselves in these spaces, and they don't, they don't, they don't feel like um, there's an intellectualism that uh, bear, bears uh, people, bars people from coming, and whether or not it's perceived or imagined, you know, is there, and they're keeping people out in the street. I mean, they're walking right past the gallery that's free, that's open, that's got refreshments, and they won't go in. I mean, they won't go in. They really won't. And they, they never, and if you ask them, why do you go in? It's true. It's open. It, uh, they're not even charging tonight. You can come in, come see the show. It never crossed their mind to go. And it's, it's, so they're going to, uh, the, the institution are doing a bad job with their PR, but bringing people in. And so that affects your budget, I'm assuming, and all that too. But the, also, as artists, I mean, we we have to. We have to reach people where they are, and that's another reason why I think that uh, you know wearing clothes and, and 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 music music is accessible. It's right there. People wear they make art out of their sneakers. So they love the artists. Is they get it, but there's something that's a barrier, there's a blockage. And I don't. I'm not saying I have an answer, but I, I I think we should think about it. There's a blockage between what the institution who are there to serve the people, but they aren't in the way that is most efficient. Right now. Thank you, Francis. That's a beautiful and excellent point, right? Roy? Um, so we've talked about quite a few things in that little spiel. Um, so I kind of wanted to speak on the college education system. I know some of you are um, teaching our education, have received our education. And I wanted to speak a little bit on that before I go into the question. But as a black um, like student at a predominantly white school, I haven't had any black teachers that are, actually no, I haven't had any black teachers. I don't know why I was trying to like, go around and I just haven't had any black teachers or professors. And I can't remember having a black art professor and it's cool that we have um, a few of you guys, or sorry, people who are on, you know, or in the institution of like school. And so it's kind of weird that like we don't have this access for black artists. And as a film major, basically, I didn't know who Oscar Michelle was. I think I said his name wrong, um, but I didn't know who that was until literally last year. And if you ask anybody in this room, they probably won't know about it. But the fact that black film has been around since the 1920s, 30s, and a lot of people think that Spike Lee is one of the first, or Tyler Perry, who has recently been, you know, he got a governor's award by the Emmy, which is a big deal. But if you think about it, this is like long overdue. And so I kind of wanted to talk about how do you, like, how important do you think that Black people, Black students learn about different art mediums and learn about different Black artists at a young age and in the educational system? Rosa, you have an interesting story about, like, you know, you come to our education. Can you share that? I'm Roosevelt Lasseter. And, um, see, I believe education is a key. But I also think that, you know, just um, outside life, you know, helps too. You know, the, 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 the being placed around more people, more ideas more uh, environments because you're coming to the institution, uh, people are coming from around the world. And so then that can help your art, you know, to a degree when you are sharing ideas, which I think is very important. You know, when you're, um, when you're denied access, you know, to be able to do that, you know, a lot of times when the African-American community, you know, it's like, um, I think some of the parts like when Francis, you were talking about people not wanting to go into the gallery, uh, people are feeling, um, I guess ignorant to what's going on because they don't feel like they're being coerced enough to come into the conversation. And I think school opened up those uh, channels and doors for um, you know creators when we had that environment because like ACA was art school and that was like love for me once I went to art school versus um, uh, university because it was like. Uh, I needed to just constantly be immersed in drawing or, or painting and not concerned with words and, and stuff of that nature on the creative side. 
So I'm um, going to answer your question. This is kind of first, in a way. Oh, yeah. Oh, Chris, go ahead. Um, so, like, for me, I'm, I'm largely a self taught artist. I'm going to school now at 32, uh, back to school for art. Or they, like, uh, um, Dustin and Princess were talking about earlier with the uh, hip hop music and black culture, how um, I really don't have any problems with the music, like getting that out there and, and getting it accepted. And so for me, when I first went to, to college, I went to school for music. And I think that part of the reason I went to school for music is because I saw reflections of successful black musicians. So I always wonder, like, had I seen reflections of like su successful black artists, like these people would I have gone to school for art instead. And so now that I, I see the, the reflections out there and um, I see people, you know, like Carrie James uh, selling like million dollar pieces and stuff, um, and, and not even just the, the money thing, but just the success. And, and you know, recently we've seen a lot of uh, magazines um, with black artists featured on the covers and um, fashion collaborations and, and just, just all kind of all kind of things that they all kind of access. Um, I think it's, it's part of the reason that motivated me, that motivated me to um, get back in school and, and to get a more uh, formal art education because I see that there are people out there who um, look like me who got the education and, and you know they're successful and so I'm inspired to follow in their footsteps. So I think that school is important. Um, it's also not the only way to make it. Um, I, I've done a Pretty much, I've done a lot by myself. Um, well, not by myself, but I've had help like, from all these people and, and other artists I know, but um, without that, that formal education. So there was a lot that I had to learn on my own and stuff. But I just wish I had seen like examples like you see here on stage a lot sooner. Well, so for me, I guess I can sort of give the perspective kind of similar to Rory in that. Um, I was a black female student at Florida State, so a predominantly white institution. Um, I took this out of the blue, I kind of bounced around. I took a class called Survey of African American Art History with a black professor who I didn't know existed until I took the class. And um, it was in there, in that classroom, that I decided that maybe I could do this art thing, you know. So it wasn't until that point of contact was made that it was even a possibility for me. And then a lot of them up here have heard this story because I tell this story all the time. Like when I approached this professor, and it was Professor Ed Love, and I said, you know, hey, I'm interested in the studio program. So not just like a graphic design degree, um, but a, a specific studio art degree. He pretty much, um, he wouldn't even have a conversation with me like out in public. He was just like, meet me in my office. You know, and just long story short, in his office, he very specifically, this, this black male art professor, very specifically said to this, you know, black female prospective student, like, don't waste my time. You know, he was like, don't waste my time. If you're going to get into this program, you'll be the only you here, and you have to take it seriously, straight up. Like if you're gonna, it's like if you're gonna step into this lineage and this line, you have to take it seriously. And that was my open door to like the art world. And I've sort of stood in that space since then. So now as an art educator, I try to make sure I'm sort of doing the same thing. I am trying to reach students um, and get them to take it seriously. I am, we try to intentionally, um, like connect the dots. So I teach at Jacksonville Arts and Music School, which is an after school program for public school kids. Um, we have different houses. My particular house is called House Savage after Augusta Savage, our film students. This house is Michelle, after Oscar Michelle. So we're trying to you know connect those dots for kids now. And then just um, the small amount of time that I spent in higher ed, I was an adjunct professor at UNF for a little while. And like, I want to say, like, on my second class, 
like I went to class one day and like the black students who were in the program started to find me. Like I heard we had black folks, you know. So that's like kind of rare. Is. You know, a lot of times you don't really think about it. But there, there's not that many black professors out there. I'm not currently a black professor, but there's not that many out there. So when you're in a when you're like me and you're sort of like the only black kid in the in the room and you have these very specific you know, and all of us don't. We don't ever want to make you believe that all black people who make art make work specifically about black people and black people's stuff, you know, because that's not true. But I did in particular, some of the students at UNF did in particular, and they struggled with professors who didn't take the time to understand, who brought off what they were doing as like, this is nonsense, I don't, you know, I don't get it do something else versus like really sort of trying themselves to step into that space with them and like understand what they were trying to say. So it's necessary that we have access to the people who look like us. Hopefully institutions will start to hire more people. For me, it's been difficult to get into that space. And that's not 100% on these like institutions and stuff like that. That's that has a lot to do with me also. But for me, it has been difficult to break into higher ed um, for the long time. But it's changing. So I'm thinking a little bit to that point, kind of segue. Um, you, you talked a bit about first, right? And how your professor at that time was like, you're going to be this, this only, so you don't have to come with this. A lot of us sit on the nexus of those first, and you know, that kind of backbone building of you have to come in here, you have to be representative, you have to be at a thousand percent, because other people get to be at 70 percent, and we'll still get wild and you can still do all that work. And still not be seen. And you spoke about higher education and that representation you all talked about. So I think, you know, even though <laughs> you just put someone on the spot a bit, I think it's always important. I tell Justin all the time the unicorn that he is in our community, being, I think, again, you need to go on to understand this gentleman is the only Black arts professor full time <laughs> in Jacksonville that is also an arts professor. And you know, as identifying as black male, I guess I say that's pretty great. That's so important. And around your work of galvanizing, but not necessarily pigeonholing, even those determinants, but it's important, right? And 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 you being the only full-time, you know, tenured professor, those experiences, how have you navigated those challenges and brought more artists of color without having to break that barrier? That exists sometimes for academia. So I, I didn't. So for the past 15 years, I have been the only one around here. I, it, it kind of dawned on me a few years after the fact. I mean, there are obviously a lot of questions that come in and out, but as far as full time in the programs, um, it's, you know, it's, it's funny. You're, <laughs> when we talk, it's, this comes up, but I don't even think that this is a. Something that anyone thinks about at all anyway. So it's kind of hard for me to even talk about. I mean, it just is what it is. It's always been that way. I would love to have a, another a counterpart that I can meet up with and talk to about certain issues. It's just never been that way, but that's been my normal. So, but from graduate school, I think I was mostly always the only black kid in the room. So I, so it just became a regular thing. Regular representation, right? But still, that ability to to make opportunities, knowing from your experiences, I think is an important discussion for the students. I've spent a lot of hours with a lot of young artists, trying to give a lot of my time because that was one thing that I feel like I did not have was a mentor coming out of school, and I think that that's a very, very important thing. It's a very crucial thing that I don't think people talk about in the passing, but it's extremely important. And so um, all I feel like I can do is just be available for as many people as possible who need to talk and deal with them. So, yeah. Thank you for that, Dustin. Rory? Um, I just want to piggyback on the thing that Justin, uh, Dustin, my bad, just said, um, how like, important a mentor is. And so I want to kind of, this is an honor of those list of questions, but I kind of want to ask, especially for, I think all of us have always kind of, I feel like everyone in this room that's 
black has felt the kind of like you're the only person in the room that is black. In most of my classes, I'm one of the only black person. So a lot of questions about race and racial issues come up to me. So like one one of my professors asked about like we were talking about like the melanin in our skin, how that's an adaptation and genetics. And he said, where are you from? And for, I feel like a lot of our counterparts, you can always, they can ask, they can say, I'm from Eastern Europe, Germany. And I said, I have no idea. I could be from West, East, North, I don't really know. So what, I'm getting into the question. Um, so for you guys, like how has having someone who's been there for you as a mentor, an partner, or a friend, how has that helped you like have a sense of community and collaboration in your art? Well, um, <clears throat> well, um, the, the collaboration for my work is that through Shawana being such as agent, because in Jacksonville, you know, um, there are no agents for the arts, for, for the visual arts, I should say. Um, we still don't have really a gallery system to um, kind of connect and uh, propel you to the next stage in your career like other cities. And so um, having her to, to where we are now, um, to have people that are kind of looking for artists or looking for things, and then now it prompts you to create the work uh, in, my, in my speed. You know, I, I don't like to kind of just do you know, I kind of like to uh, be in the process for a reason. I know every day is supposed to be a reason that you create, but um, shows and, and, and warmth and stuff that they can kind of fuse the, the, the fire for me to create. You know, so um, having having an advocate out there for the artists, it, it helps a lot. Yeah. I would say the same thing, like, you know, Princess mentioned early on, you know, that a lot of times you do have, like, artists do have these egos that you have to deal with. But it's really kind of a blessing for us, I think, because we all do work so well together. Like, specifically, like, Princess and I, have, we, like, mastermind together. You know, like, our studios are just, like, right around the corner from, like, a few steps from each other. So, you know, me and her, we, she can go in her studio and paint, I can go in my studio and paint, and we both think we're great painters, and that's, that's wonderful. But Chris and I sit and talk about how are we going to make money? Like, how are we going to grow as business people? And we sit and ask them about that. You know, Shawana and I probably, like, think the biggest together, you know, like, um, how can we, like, change the city? How can we change the state? How can we change the world for people who look like us, you know? Me and Chris, um, Chris is kind of like my little brother. Um, he's like your little brother who's like done all these great things and you're trying to figure out um, like, dude, should I be following him or should he be following me? And we have this great sort of like exchange and you know, we're always like, if, if there's a show, if there's a show out there, you know, we're, we're not just kind of like kind of bored that show for ourselves, we're gonna send it to each other. If there's some, like somebody talking, we're not gonna like, you know, try to just keep it to ourselves. We're gonna make sure we take everybody with us. Like we spend all the time, like we are all gonna go together. So it's been cool in that sense, like just the way that we all collaborate in our spaces and we all just kind of function as mentors to each other. And I think in the, I did come back when I was in like grad school, I didn't come back to Jacksonville for like an extra five years because I didn't think there was an art community here. So now in this time, you know, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be a part of this community. And just a little bit of change that's happened since I've come back to Jacksonville, I can only imagine like, what comes next for us. And the fact that we're going to make this thing like an art city for all of us together is, is the best part for me. Um, I just wanted to speak on that really quickly because I am the youngest person on here. I'm, I'm only 20. So, like, <laughs> I have friends, like I said, that are in our scene. Um, as you probably all know, that a bunch of the musicians there, black musicians, made an album called Duval. Um, you guys should like, listen to it, it's pretty good. Um, just want to put a plug in there. So, like, they are all kind of making this music, which is in the form of art. And I, I know we have, I think, a question for, from the audience, and I just want to thank. So, like, I kind of want to just 
put this quick question, like when you were younger, um, which probably for most of you were just like five years ago. Um, so <laughs> when you guys were younger, like how did it feel to like be black and be an artist and kind of like, like if you're from Jacksonville, how did it feel like to leave Jacksonville and come back and kind of want to want to come back? Because a lot of like artists like me, I personally don't want to come back to Jacksonville anytime soon because as a filmmaker, there's not a film scene. But for all of you, there's a thriving art scene that could have this splinter of film. How did it feel to like leave, or if you didn't leave, but how did it feel to leave and then come back and want to actually come back? Well, I left and came back a couple times. <laughs> And the last time we even was when my wife got married, and we moved to Savannah and began to get uh, get inundated with the culture of Savannah and the old art scene of the tourist town and um, seeing the, the semi reflection of Jacksonville with our river walk and the aspect of history that we have that could be, I guess, exploited, but you know, just you know, given out as, as tools and, and, and candy for people who come through. Uh, the, the Northeast, and um, man, I, I, I'm just I'm just really blown away. Like once Art Walk came to Jacksonville, it set a stage that art was needed because we brought uh, musicians, and dancers, and the other parts of the art culture together, and uh, we came back in uh, I think it was 2011, and you know, everything has been uh, uh, the crescendo of the wave, I guess, you know, where we've been really riding that wave now, you know, and um, COVID set it down, and now we're getting ready to go again because now as creators, we have to reevaluate how we want to survive. We want to keep doing this art thing, and most of us are going to keep doing this art thing because the art chose us. And we want to have to find a way to, to re innovate and re uh, invigorate, you know, how we're going to do what we're going to do. And that's what's happening, you know, through uh, this Color Jacks Blue and all the other uh, uh, injustice murals and things that are popping up. It's still a part that's talking. And that's the way of, 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 of communication and how, you know, we communicate. You know, we just communicate visually. A lot of times the words are missing, but here's the visual. I would take one more point. I think we need to wrap it up for the Q&A. Does anybody else have um, Just one small thing to add specifically to you, um, at the age that you are, I would absolutely encourage you to go out and experience. I did that too. I didn't go far. I only went to a ramp, you know. Um, but I did leave for a while. I left for about eight years and came back. But go out and experience as much as you can in as many different places with as many people but you, when it comes to a place like Jacksonville, Jacksonville is as much of a hindrance as it is an opportunity. You know, it's as much of a hole as it is a portal. So you can go out and do these things in places where there are a million of you, you know, or you can go get great at what you do and make Jacksonville what you want it to be, or a place like Jacksonville what you want it to be. So for me, it was kind of like that. When I was leaving Atlanta, my thought process, even though I was not in the art field, I wasn't back in arts yet. I was in like a whole different field, but my thought process was there's a million people here doing what I'm trying to do. There's not nobody in Jacksonville doing it. So let me go to Jacksonville now and try to go over the city and hopefully in about 10 years' time, you know, I will have built my own name as Jacksonville World of the City. And that happened for me, it just happened to, you know, work in, in the art field. But don't always like sometimes something there's a niche somewhere that you don't quite think it is. So I'm not someone you have to find that and go there. <laughs> I think that's all but I one one caveat is that is that it's kind of on what Aaron said. Uh, last two years ago, I went to New York for an art world conference, and it was his first year, and it was fantastic. And I'm from Jersey, uh, mostly, and so being in New York was wonderful. Anyway, I'm hanging out um, after hours, and my friend takes me all around the city, and we see the skyline of New York. We're on top of a club. We're looking, and it's just beautiful, and it's just the sky, and it's the city. All I mean, we're in New York City at night. It's it's magnificent, and my mind is just expanded just from the view, right? Exposure 
in a place that's happening and where big things, where people have big ideas and they're thinking big all the time, being in that environment is great. But also leaving that environment and going home to a smaller place, it can be beneficial. So I would recommend going, traveling, experiencing big ideas, being part of big things, and, but then coming back to a smaller place where you can breathe and have the space to create but all the distractions. The other issue is I'm there at the conference and a lot of the people, the artists are, are coming from all over the country, but then there's also a very large New York artist segment and they start complaining about all this stuff, about what's happening in New York and what's wrong with our scene in New York and all this. And basically they say the same thing that we talk about in Jacksonville. And I'm like, hey, y'all y'all in New York. <laughs> y'all are New York artists, <laughs> okay? But but it's it's the same same problems everywhere. No studios, no rent out of control, all this kind of stuff. No one lets you in. You know, it's clickish. What they got the same problems no matter where we go. So really, that's a little bit for me a learning experience to say go where big ideas are happening, and then come back and make big ideas happen where you are. That's that's perfect. Um, so at this particular time, I know we don't have around that much time. I'm gonna turn it back over to. Uh, Sure, she will take over so that she can um, give any questions to the panelists that you all have had. Hello? I feel like I'm on a talk show, you know, when they cut out to, you know, a commercial, they come back and that person's standing in a different part of the room. So I didn't, I was just checking the Zoom feed to see if there were any questions, and there were not. Um, but does anybody in the audience have a question that you want to throw out? Do you want to just yell it out? <laughs> no, that's all right. Just yell it out, and then I'm going to yell. But then I'm going to repeat it so that people who are listening on the stream can hear. Can you hear me on the stage? Yes. yes. I'm pretty good at production. So, um, one of just thinking over the last six months that we've all lived through, and just all of the crap we've lived through, and then you know on our social media feeds, all of the images we've seen. One of you know we've seen lots of ugly stuff, but I think some beautiful stuff too. And one of the most beautiful images I saw was I can't remember what monument face they were standing in front of, but there was a picture that I think it circulated pretty widely of these two black ballerinas on point in front of a spray painted monument uh, where a guy on a horse is just in his office, right? Um, so I just thought that was like a really kind of poetic summary of what we're all living through um, because I think there's possibility in some of the horrible stuff that's going on right now, right? So they, these two beautiful women who are thoroughly creative standing in front of this destruction, um, it just made me really think about the relationship between creation and destruction. And so right now, with everything going on, people are getting more creative and more active, and things are getting dismantled. Maybe something's not fast enough. <laughs> But so I was just wondering if you have been thinking about in your own personal art practices ways that your creation might be destroyed or dismantling something, or ways that you have to destroy something in order to create, or just kind of what you think about that relationship lately. Yeah. How am I, um, how am I gonna repeat this? <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Okay, I'm just repeating this so hopefully people who are listening and can hear. Um because I think this sounds a little, maybe a little muffled on the Zoom. But so Leslie's question from the audience is, um, what, how, maybe considering the time that we're living in and sort of these images that we've seen, and Leslie referenced um, an image of a Confederate statue man on a horse that was filled with graffiti. I think that might be in Richmond. Yeah, is that right? I think it was that. Okay. Um, where there was an image of two black ballerinas on point, um, sort of standing in front of this thing that's you know 
about to be dismantled. So I guess the the question is um, the connection between sort of creation and destruction, and how how maybe have you considered that in your own work? Well. Can I, can I say a separate thing about 2020? So I'm one of the privileged people who still has a steady paycheck, so I understand my comments. I have to be sensitive about things. But 2020, to me personally, people are saying it's the worst year ever. I feel like it's the best year ever. The times in my life when significant change happened, I was not flat. And then I had, and I had this big jump forward. And I feel like in 2020, We've been cruising along for a very long time, and we've just been knocked right off the rails. And a lot of people are freaking out about it. But my God, I've never seen the civil rights movement just watching that footage, wondering what it was like. In 2020, I don't think I've ever seen Black people in such a position of power in this country ever. I mean, Naomi Osaka just decided that she, after that last guy got shot, and she's like, playing with the U.S. Open, and she's just like, well, I'm not playing my match today. Or the NBA taking off two or three days after that happened. They stopped the tournament for Naomi Osaka instead of continuing. I'm like, when in the history of this country did something like that ever happen before? And it's happening in 2020. It blows my mind. And that kind of is what you were just describing. When have we seen this before? I'm sorry. So anyway, we can pick up from there, but I just want to say, and it's very hard as artists because I feel like we are in it, right? You know, pardon the pun, but you say hindsight is 2020. <laughs> in 10 years from now, looking back, will we fully understand what's going on? But sometimes when you're in the storm itself, it's really kind of hard to describe it, you know, accurately. As artists, it's like all this stuff is happening all around us. And can we even articulate what's happening? The same way Julie was having a hard time trying to figure out the title for that show and what the hell is even going on right now. This is, these are exciting times, guys. This is, his, this is major history. I'm very excited about it. Did you have something to add? Well, I was going to say the, um, the, the process of kind of letting go of the old and stepping into a new, um, the COVID made me exercise that because we were actually coming out of the gallery scene and creating an a external gallery that would invite the community that wouldn't necessarily normally come to a whole. So then I have to take my creations that were created for the indoors and protected to bring them to the outside. And to kind of see the destruction of them, it was, it, it, it was like watching your baby die. Like, you know, Give your baby oxygen, but you couldn't because you just got to like watch it die. But it was for a greater purpose. And what's happening now with our social distancing and people reevaluating their position in this world is for a greater purpose. You know, it's for a greater purpose that now people of privilege can see that people of color, uh, black, brown, um, olive, Carmel, you know, that they, they really have um, been taken a lot and it's just not right and that people are being allies and are changing their position and can truly help them. And I think what's happening now with, with, um, uh, with our art is just helping because uh, we are offering doors to be open to have conversations that are hard because like most of the time people don't want to have a conversation. Or, and then now through the art we're having these conversations and hopefully we're starting to heal because that's the disconnect. The disconnect is that um, all of us have been taught that black people have just been slaves and uh, they're intellectually inferior. And now we're seeing that our art is to be connected, our art is to be uh, um, admire, and I think that, well, I know that it's, it's doing those things because my heart is, it has sparked conversations, we've got national coverage with it, and Princess, Aaron, Dustin, Chris, Oak Street, Marsha, you know, everybody that's in Jacksonville 
on the foundation of these things. So this is what's happening now. We are now the um, Jacob Lawrence's and Augusta Savages of, of our era. So I know and believe that the art is definitely changing the game. Yeah, I, I, I really think like, just as an artist or as artists, the notion of like creation and destruction is sort of the place we always live anyway. Like art can, art making can be a very sort of singular, very sort of arrogant thing, you know? Like I know the world is moving out there, but I'm gonna go by myself in my studio and I'm gonna make art about what I think, about what I love, about what I wanna say. And when I decide to put it, to put it back out in the world, you know, I am asking that you guys come to this thing with me. Like I think it just comes from a very cool but arrogant place, you know. So this this whole life, it's like we kind of see things out there that are, and we decide, well, no, I don't agree with that, or I think a little differently about that. I have a different perspective, and I want to show you that perspective. So we kind of just operate in this space of creation and destruction all the time, and that could be something as simple as the technical in terms of how art is being being made. It could be something like you know the who, you know. I think Princess does that. Princess is an abstract artist, and you might see her work on the wall and not know that she's a, a black female you know, artist, but you see this beautiful work. So I think she, in the work that she makes, which I, I personally think is, um, for abstract work, it, it really communicates to me more than a lot of abstract work does sometimes. Um, I think in her doing that, she is like destruct, um, she's destructing that notion of, you know, do black people make abstract work? or can anybody make abstract work? So in all of our kind of individual spaces, we're sort of in that process of creation and destruction all the time. And I think that's what makes it sort of a beautiful thing that we do, that you know, we do have the opportunity. Um, we made a way for ourselves to kind of operate in that space and not starve, you know, and take care of families and, and, and try to make the best life for ourselves. So it's, it's beautiful to see it all happening now out loud, you know? Um, and to see it happening in all these different spaces. And I am really interested to see, one, how this gets recorded, you know, um, what story is told 10 years from now about this time. You know, and hopefully we're all sort of doing the work ourselves to tell our own stories, but that would be the most interesting part to me. It's like, because, you know, we know what's left out of history books from before. So it would be really interesting for me to see in this place of like creation and destruction in this time right now, how the story is told later on. Well, I just wanted this to pick back with the, with the creation and destruction, and I appreciate what Aaron was talking about was brought in abstraction. Because for me, uh, the type of abstraction that I, 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 I champion is um, it's being called uh, social abstraction. And uh, Mark, Mark Bradford, uh, Point the phrase, but there's a few other artists working internationally in that vein. But it's really about, uh, abs you know, ab abstraction that deals with social content. And uh, it's in the way that poetry does, in the way that abstract jazz music does, you know. And, and for me, all my heart has been in my, it's a, the voice in my back of my head for weeks has been saying, you know, Black joy is a revolutionary act. You understand? And so, for me, when I'm painting, I'm purely abstracted, abstractly, especially some of the latest stuff. I'm, it's, I'm, it's, I'm exuding and, it's, and uh, sharing black joy, right? Among the trauma that just going on Facebook triggers me to, to have, you know what I'm saying? So among the trauma of our world, when we hit the news, you're still, you're still able to have joy, and they have to coexist because you, you can't deny that, that there's trauma out there. I mean, it happens not just to black people, but but all kinds of people in, based on class and and um, and, and uh, prejudice and so forth. So, but I think joy in general, joy of life is a revolutionary act, and I think we need more of that joy. All of us should experience it. I actually was going to piggyback off of that before you actually said it. But this time, especially with COVID, and as someone who's like in love with film and television, COVID gave everyone an excuse to like absorb black entertainment or just anything that was on television or 
all these, you know, streaming ads. And then as soon as the protest started, a lot of people saw like this, I mean, you were at home, you could see all this black um, entertainment. Of course, people, for some reason, wanted to watch The Help, which is not, you know, a good movie to watch to get educated, but a lot of articles came out that, you know, had all this entertainment that you could watch as black art that gave you a sense of what black people go through. And I think that while we are destroying, you know, we're hopefully trying to destroy systems of racism, um, we're also creating these new, like, avenues that people can, you know, watch films that, and absorb art that isn't, you know, based in trauma, because there's films like Queen and Slim that, yes, it is talking about trauma, but it does also show a little bit of black love. But then we get better movies that are about black love, like The Photograph, and people don't know that, but they know Queen and Slim. So I think we're going to get into an age where black art isn't going to be just defined by its trauma, but it's going to be defined by its humanity. So that's the all I want to say as a person. I just want to just uh, mention that Black art, on the discussion of Black people and Black pain and, uh, and injustices that have impact to our community, I think what, I don't want us to lose sight on what's the, the, the point is when, when, when Black people in general, people of color have are expressing that and, and people are listening and, 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 and empathizing with the situation. Humanity wins, not black humanity, not white humanity. Humanity wins. So when we all start listening to each other and recognizing other people's trauma and other people's pain and how that we have, uh, we're living in a society and instead of ignoring other people and what they're going through, we, we, we empathize with them. We all win. And, and I, the game here is not for black people to win. It's the game is for humanity to win, I think. You know, but humanity can't win when people are being marginalized of any color. You know, and as a black person, I'm sensitive to the fact that <laughs> of what's happening to black people. But everyone should be sensitive to, to what's happening because we have to share this world. I want to say one quick thing. Um, so speaking of humanity, I actually have a piece in the show um, titled "I Am a Human." And um, so my, my main reason for creating that piece and other pieces like it, um, I particularly work in um, portraiture. And so the thing that I'm trying to dismantle or deconstruct is the negative images and stereotypes we see about uh, black men, um, young black men in particular. Um, whenever there's like injustice, like Maude Arbery, um, Jordan Davis, Trayvon Martin, yeah, that's the feature right there. Um, yeah, so, you know, any, any of those names, um, Tamir Rice, like the, the list goes on and on. The, the first word you always see attached to those images are words like thug or hoodlum or what were they doing here or, or why did they have that particular outfit on? Like everybody wears hoodies. Like, what's wrong with the hoodie? Um, when you see images of them in the media, it's not there high school graduation, not at their birthday party, you know, it, it's them being a teenager in a room, shooting the middle finger, which everybody has done, um, or, or showing tattoos, which a lot of people have. So we always get these negative uh, images attached to these faces. So in my work, I, I, a lot of times I want to show images of black men um, just simply being, and um, just showing their humanity and I, I just want the viewer to know that we're not all these things you see in the media, you know, we're not thugs and gangsters um, just because of the way we wear our hair or um, whatever outfit we may choose to wear that day. Um, you know, we're students, uh, artists, parents, teachers, and, um, and we're just regular people just trying to live. And, and so for me personally, that, that's, uh, I guess, the, the idea that I'm trying to deconstruct with my work. Um, it's all the, the negative stereotypes um, attached to being a black male in America. You know, um, even though that was one question, that was, that the, all of you all's responses I thought was, was brilliant and, and beautiful and communicated again why public art is so important if you don't have spaces in order to get this. 
visual communication out and you still need to be expressive, that kind of social distance helps conversation in the community to start healing and talking. And I'm appreciative of all of you not only collaborating within this project, but being a part of your art process for the past years. It, it does feel like there's this big, huge wave, but as we talked about before, that wave belongs to, it's a part of so many other people and what, what they put out first and what we were able to build that momentum on and where it's so important that we all as storytellers, whether you do that through a visual interpretation or a literal interpretation or a physical interpretation, that we still keep putting that out there in order to change these instances and to create more opportunities for conversation, especially again looking out amongst this audience, right? That is predominantly white. And speaking back to you all to say, you know, your accomplices also in this work, if you want to see the success of these artists to continue, it takes also your conversation and being out there and making those connections. But regardless of whether or not you serve that audience or not, you're hearing these artists say that they have something to say and they're going to continue to say it, whether they get that specific support from institutions or not. So we hope that that support comes more fully around, but if not, black folks are going to be making more spaces and opportunities for themselves to continue that conversation to their cultural instances. So I want to thank um, everybody for their honesty and authenticity in talking about their artistic practice. I love my liberation. Um, so thank you very much, Justin Yearwood. Thank you to you, Christopher Clark. Thank you always, Roosevelt Watson III. Thank you, Aaron Kendrick. Thank you, Princess Simpson Rashid. And again, you all know the Black Student Union President, Rory. Thank you for tonight in this conversation and your uh, ability to bring everybody together and to talk about such an important topic. And again, uh, November 3rd is coming. I think there's less than 40, 40 some days, right? Um, not saying who you should vote for, just also making sure that you're ready to vote. Your time to do that is definitely right now. Today is National Voter Registration Day. If you don't know that, now you know. There's literally a day for everything. Right? So that's today. And on this first day of fall, I leave you with your vote being your voice. If you believe in things, if you want things to change, you do have to be a part of the process to change it, whether you want to deconstruct that or completely destroy it uh, if you're not playing the process. You're not going to be able to change the tables. So I encourage you all to make a plan to vote. October 19th is the start of early voting. And if you get absentee ballot, get it. Vote by mail. Uh, don't get scared of the process. As you all know, it's not corruptible. And we need to keep championing that access and opportunity for more of us to be able to vote because it is our civic duty and our right as participants of this nation. Thank you all again. And I hope you have a great evening. Thank you.